So scientists approach um, learning in a, in a way that's different than other scholars. Um, the scientific approach is based on experiment. We observe things and we experiment. This is, you know, it's not philosophy where we're just discussing ideas. We're actually doing experiments. Not that philosophy isn't good. It's just not science. Um, what we call the scientific method is a process for understanding nature. It's not a set pattern, do this, 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 and this. It's just a general idea of how you approach solving problems. And the scientific method, um, you know, as a scientist, I find myself applying this to everyday problems. Like, the car's making a noise. So then I start making observations, right? Okay, it only does that when I turn left. It doesn't do it when it's cold. It only does it when it's warmed up, things like this. Oh, well, maybe it's this. And then, well, if it's this, it should do that, right? And I'll test it like that. And I, I just can't help it because that's how my brain works now. It's good, actually. The key characteristics that we find in the scientific method um, include observation, formulation of hypotheses, experimentation, and formulation of laws and theories. Um, that's a link to a really cute little video. Um, but when I was planning this semester and looked at the times that all the videos took up um, that I used during the pandemic, it said I needed 37 and a half lecture periods to cover it all. <laughs> We've got 33. That, and that's, that would be if we do no talking and stuff. And you, you just go bang, 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 bang. So I'm going to be trimming some things out. We're not going to spend four minutes watching that video. Of course, I just wasted like 20 <clears throat> seconds talking about it. I can't help myself. So let's talk about those parts. Observations. Um, observations are also known as data. And data can be um, numerical, quantitative. You know, this thing weighs 5.2 kilograms. Or it can be qualitative, like the color of something. You know, describing the bench top, it's black. Right? That's, that's data, an observation. So that these are descriptions about the characteristics or behavior. And this is a painting of an early scientist, Antoine Lavoisier. Um, he's sitting here, and, and that's his wife. Um, and this is one of his pieces of equipment. Um, do you guys like playing with fire? Anybody? Yeah. So if you like playing with fire, you might be a secret chemist. Most chemists enjoy burning things up, right? I don't like danger, but I like, you know, because I know what's going to be safe, so I like burning things safely, right? So this guy was interested in burning stuff. So he was burning things in a closed container. Not like, you know, let's, let's talk about wood maybe. So you get a big piece of wood, and you stick it in your fireplace, and it's like miracle of miracles, it's a burn day, right? And so you burn the log. What's left when the fire's out? Does it weigh as much as it did before? No. You got some ashes, kind of messy, but they don't weigh very much. What happened to the rest of the wood? Ever think about that? Where'd it go? Yeah, it well, it turned into heat. Yeah, there is heat involved. Did the matter turn into heat? Did the matter go away? These are the sorts of questions Lavoisier was interested in. So a fireplace is open to the rest of the atmosphere, right? So if there are gases being produced, you're not gonna know what they are or where they're going, how much they weigh. So he burned things in a closed container so that if gases you know, were given off, they were still stuck in the container. And what he found was objects in this container, well, the container with the object in it, weighed the same before he burned it and after he burned it. So that was like, because that's not something that you would get, right, just by watching stuff burn. You'd think, well, when you burn something, it gets smaller, lighter, it, it gets reduced. But actually, the mass of material 
doesn't change. And so observations like this lead to the formulation of a hypothesis. What's a hypothesis? A tentative interpretation or explanation of the observations. It's us looking at what happened and coming up with, well, why might that have happened? Now, most of our hypotheses are just flat out wrong, but you don't know until you test them, right? So you come up with an idea. Well, I think it might be this. So his hypothesis was that the substance burning combines with something in the air, and, and that's why you can't see it later, but it's just, it's not gone, it's combined with the air, right? So that was his hypothesis. The thing about a hypothesis is that you need to be able to test it. You know, you can't have one where it's like, well, little green men, actually not little green men, little invisible men from Mars come and take away part of the substance when it burns. You know, weird, you can come up with some really, really weird things. How could you test that? You couldn't, right? How would you know if invisible aliens came? You wouldn't. So that's not a good hypothesis. A good hypothesis is falsifiable. We test our hypotheses by experiments. And our experiments are most useful when they are highly controlled. So you know, burning the wood in the fireplace is not a real controlled experiment because all the gases that get produced when the wood burns go away. In this controlled environment with this container, they were all trapped and then he could see what they weighed. The results of an experiment may support your hypothesis or prove it wrong. That's the more common. Scientists spend their whole careers having ideas and proving themselves wrong. But then every once in a while, you're right about something and that makes up for all the rest of it. So what if your hypothesis is wrong? Like, I quit, this is no fun, and you go off and you flip hamburgers at McDonald's. No, you try again. You, you learn from that failure. You're like, okay, well, now I know something that it isn't, right? So I'm gonna try to come up with a different explanation, and then I'm gonna test that. And sometimes it's like, well, that was, that was almost right, so I don't have to actually throw the idea out. I can just modify it a little bit and try it again. And that's how science works. So what this ultimately leads to is laws and theories. So it's important to understand the difference between a law and a theory. A scientific law is a brief statement that just says what happens. You've heard of the uh, law of gravity? Laws help us to predict what's gonna happen. So law of gravity, I'm holding this marker out. If I let go of it, what does the law of gravity say is gonna happen? It's gonna fall every single time. <laughs> it falls, right? Does the law of gravity explain why that happens? No, it just says it will. An object will move towards the center of the earth unless it's you know, held back by something else. I don't know what the exact statement of the law of gravity is. So the law that came out of Lavoisier's um, experimentation was the, the law of conservation of mass, which says that in a chemical reaction, matter is neither created nor destroyed. So the burning of that substance in his closed container, burning is a chemical reaction. And it definitely changes the substance, right? The ashes are not the same as the piece of wood that you stuck in your fireplace. But by doing this in a controlled way, he observed, and it was tested and repeated and repeated, the actual matter is still there. It's not, it doesn't get heavier, it doesn't get lighter, it's still the same. A thing that makes scientific laws different from, say, laws that the state of California has, of which there are very, very many, is you can't just say, well, I'm not gonna obey that law. It'd be fun. I'm not gonna obey the law of gravity today. I'm just <laughs> gonna float. You can't do that, right? Scientific laws just describe how nature behaves. A 
a good hypothesis will be tested and tested and tested because scientists are very um, skeptical of each other and we, we publish our work so we can see. I, I did that first, right? And then you give enough information that other people could do the same experiment and they should be able to get the same results. And they're actually gonna take the time many times to do that. They're like, well, I don't, I don't think I believe them. I wanna see if that's right. And so you do the experiment and you're like, well, yeah, that worked. So it gets tested by other people as well. A well-established hypothesis can form the basis for a theory. Unlike a law which just says what happened, the theory is a model for why it happens. So it's not just what happens, but why is that happening? So later on, John Dalton came up with his atomic theory that explains the law of conservation of mass. And he proposed that matter is composed of small indestructible particles called atoms. And in a chemical reaction, those particles, those atoms, are just rearranged. They aren't created, they aren't destroyed, they're just rearranged. So if we think of that in terms of Legos, you know, you've got some Legos and you built a little castle or something, and you put it on the scale and it weighs a certain amount, right? You take the castle apart and you make other things out of it, you put the things you made out of the castle on the scale and it's gonna weigh the same, right? Because the individual bricks didn't change, what changed is how they were stuck together. That's what's going on in a chemical reaction. The atoms are just changing how they're combined with each other, but the mass is the same because the particles are the same. And that's actually a really big, important idea in chemistry and science in general. Theories also get tested um, by experiment. One of the things that um, can be a little frustrating is in science, we can never prove something to be correct or true. You can't prove that something's true. You can prove it's not true, which can be fun, but you can't prove it's true because new information may come that sheds a new light on your hypothesis and all of a sudden, well, it's, that's not, not quite right. That was true based on what we knew at the time. And this is a little bit like what happened in the early days of COVID, right? We got a lot of conflicting messages from the authorities. They were saying, don't wear masks. And they were saying, do wear masks. And they were saying, do this, and no, don't do that. And it was just like, what's going on? And the general public who doesn't understand science, I really came to understand how little the general public knows about science. It's, it's actually really scary. Um, if you don't understand how science works, that looks like chaos and people waffling and not being sticking to their convictions and stuff. But that's actually what should happen. Because they come out and they say something. And it's based on the knowledge that they have at the time. And nobody ever claimed to know exactly what was going on. But they were in charge, and so a lot of people thought, well, they must know what they're doing. Nobody knew what was going on. But this was their best hypothesis of what would be good to do. And then as things go on, we were actually all part of this giant worldwide experiment, which was not very well run, but, you know, it is what it is. So then they come out and they say, oh, well, no, 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 this thing. They're not being fickle or you know, two-faced or something, they are changing their minds based on new information. And that is a really responsible thing to do. So any theory, we may have no evidence currently that it is incorrect, and so we're going with that, but we understand that it is a theory and it may be proved incorrect in the future. Um, Theories, though, are as close to truth as you can get in science. And unlike in you know, everyday language, you, you know, somebody has an idea, oh, well, that's just a theory. Well, in science, it's not just a theory. A theory has been tested. That's not just somebody's wild idea. That might be a hypothesis, but it's not a theory. Theory's been tested. 
So this illustrates um, kind of a process. Like I mentioned before, it's not a, a set of rules. It's not a recipe for success. It'd be kind of nice if it was that way, but it's not. It's very messy. So it, it'll go in, in loops. So you have observations. You have a hypothesis. You test it with an experiment. You confirm your hypothesis, or you revise the hypothesis and test it again. And it'll go around these loops. And it's not just one person testing it. Other people will test it as well. From this hypothesis, you may develop a theory, because this is being confirmed. You may develop a theory. Well, the theory also gets test and tested and confirmed or disproved by experiment. Um, from observations, we can come up with laws. You know, every time you drop the pencil, it falls to the floor. Well, you know, you do that with a whole bunch of things, and that eventually becomes the law of gravity. But then the laws are also tested and confirmed and tested and confirmed. So it's actually very messy, but there's also a lot of discovery that happens in that process. So here's a question. Um, and anytime you have multiple choice question, you should always read all the choices. You can make, you know, like no, yes on them, but read them all before you make your choice. So which statement best explains the difference between a law and a theory? A law is truth, a theory is mere speculation. A law summarizes a series of related observations. A theory gives the underlying reasons for them. Or a theory describes what nature does. A law describes why nature does it. B. The answer is B. C is stated much more concisely, but it's exactly backwards. Because a law describes what nature does, and a theory describes why. So B is the correct answer. And A is just someone who doesn't understand science. 